And I just advise everybody that we have, including myself and other three members in the room, we have the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong, we have Andy Allen and we also have Robin Newton joining us today in the room. And on Starleaf at present we, members we have Fra McCann, uh, Sinead Innes and Mark Durkin. Can I just remind members as well about the necessity of putting your um, uh, phones or your uh, tablets onto silence? Uh, oh no, you don't have to do that. What am I talking about? You don't have to do that because we do that for you. So that was a good start today. There you go. Um, so just remind members actually that um, whenever you're being called in to speak, just like as if you were in plenary session, give it a couple of seconds um, for the micro your microphone to be turned on. And unless you're called in, your microphone won't be turned on. Okay, I'll move on then and just remind members if there are any declarations of interest um, of any of the briefings today to make those known at the beginning of the briefings. And I'll move then on to item agenda number one, which is apologies. I have one apology from Johnny Buckley, um, who said he would try to make it, but I'll give his apology now in case he doesn't. I'll move then on to agenda item number two. Um, members, uh, you'll find in your meeting packs on your tabled item uh, a note that was taken at a conversation I had with the minister on Friday. Um, it was very, very helpful, very useful, and I'd, at that, I had also asked the minister would she then uh, be available to come in and brief us um, before the term ends at the end of July, and she's more than happy to do that. Um, I then had said to the, uh, the committee clerk, if he could draw up a note to send to the minister. I think uh, we know it's a short period of time the minister will have with us next week. Um, so we want to make our questions as focused as possible and as themed as possible. It's not a free for all to ask every question under the sun of various burning issues. I think it has to be more focused than that. And we need to have that focused of, of um, uh, going forward. Uh, and uh, her priorities within the department. So are ministers happy enough with the, that at the moment, with that tabled items, or have they any comment they want to make on that? I know Andy, you wanted to make a comment on that tabled item? Yes, Chair. Thank, Andy. thank you, Chair. And just, just before commencing my comments, uh, I want to declare an interest in respect of the topic. As a, a charity trustee, uh, I managed to grab a brief conversation with the minister yesterday in relation to the uh, latest position from the Charities Commission regarding charity registrations emanating from the Court of Appeal uh, and the Minister has undertaken to, to look into it um, and, and come back to ourselves. She she's advised that obviously departmental officials are working on that and it's just if we can maybe look towards giving the Minister a heads up that we might uh, broach that subject next week given its significance, if we can possibly. Yes, Andy, thank you for that. I think that um, is, a, a, is a very good idea that we add that on to the list. And also just to remind members, if they, if they can read over the list, I think Kevin sent that out this morning by email, um, if they can read over that list of, of queries or questions <coughs> that we have for the minister. And if they have anything further, can they please notify the clerk um, over and above that if there's anything other than that. But I just want to remind members, next week is a time-limited meeting the minister has, and we want to be as focused as possible possible um, in our line of questioning. I'll move on then from that. I don't think there's any members. Nope, nobody's asking to speak at the moment. I'll move on to that to another item of chairperson's business. On Monday, uh, Monday of this week, the 29th of June, I took part in a cross-party meeting with the arts sector, and I know some of the members um, of committee also were present on that, um, where we, we just heard about their plight. Uh, again, of how difficult the struggles are for those that are, are within um, our arts sector. And I, I suppose I, I just want to put on record as well and comment that, uh, you know, it's good to see that yesterday um, four million pound was um, received through the June monitoring round for the arts sector. Um, I, I just think it would be good to know um, from the minister as well as from the department, just how that money is going to be spent and how that's going to be rolled out. Um, I know certainly that the, the arts sector were looking for a hardship fund. That is what that one of their asks was at the meeting, certainly on Monday and our meeting last week with them. So it would be good, I think, if we then now write back to the department and the minister to ask just how that money is going to be rolled out and you know um, how, how, how those members of, of the arts can apply for that if members are in agreement with that. Is that okay? Yes? All right. Um, then that's me finished with chairperson's business. I'm going to move on then to agenda item number three, which is the draft minutes. Um, you'll find those members at page six of your meeting pack of the meeting held last week on the 25th of June. Can I ask our members content with the minutes as drafted? 
Agreed. All content? Good. Thank you. I'll then move on to agenda item number four, which is matters arising. Member, you've been provided at page 13 of your meeting pack with a departmental reply to committee queries on the sports hardship fund criteria. Um, again, it was good to see yesterday in the monitoring round um, £2 million pounds of additional funding um, going towards uh, for sports uh, as part of that June monitoring round. So it's just to ask members if they have any comments or content to notice. Hey, Kelly, you have your hand up. you want to go ahead? I do. Um, on page two of the letter that we have received, which is page 14 of our pack, um, the Sport NI confirms that there will be a £3 million pounds of lottery funding. I'm just wondering, is is that not three million pounds now? Is that the two million pounds that the minister has talked about in the June monitoring round, or is there an additional three million pounds there? It's just where that three million pounds is coming from, um, and welcome it absolutely. There needs to be contingency funding for the sports sector and improving resilience. But it's I just I'm not sure if that amount now has been reduced following the June monitoring round, or it actually means that there's five million going towards sport. Okay, we can ask for clarification on that. That's fine. Yep, absolutely. Um, any other members want to come in on that part of matters arising? Are they happy enough to carry on? Yep, yep. we're all happy to carry on. Um, then if members could turn then to page 15 of your packs, and there's a departmental reply to committee queries on the COVID-19 emergency food parcel scheme. Again, can I ask members, have they any comments? Or are they content to note? Okay, no comments, all content to note. I'll move on then. Um, uh, where am I now? Okay, yes, members. Again, we've uh, the committee has received a second request from the Ulster Ulster Orchestra um, to brief us. Um, can I suggest first and foremost to committee that they send us an oral briefing first and foremost? Um, sorry, or sorry, a written briefing. Sorry, I'm being corrected here. Uh, if they can send me a written brief, or a written brief, and first and foremost, um, and I think it, it, I certainly think that when we come back um, after recess in September, uh, the arts will maybe have a better understanding then of where we stand when it comes to theatre openings. Maybe, maybe they will, maybe they won't, but we maybe have a better understanding then. And I certainly know from that meeting that I attended on Monday with the arts sector, it was pointed out the difficulties that orchestras will have. Um, when it comes to, to putting on uh, live performances again, especially around social distancing. So that, I just want to say, if we can ask for a written brief in the first instance and then look at the possibility um, of then getting a, an oral briefing from the Ulster Orchestra um, into our early, or, our early autumn session, would members agree with that? Agreed. Happy enough? Yep. yep, okay, thank you. Agreed. All right, Ram and I. Agenda item number five, yes? Agenda item number five, then, is our solace update briefing on the impact of COVID-19 on local councils. Members, you have been provided with papers starting at page 18 of your meeting. And then can I go on then and can I welcome Jackie Dixon, who's the Solace uh, Northern Ireland Chair, Suzanne Wiley, Chief Executive of Belfast City Council, Alfie Dallas, Lead Finance Officer, Derry City and Straban District Council, Ronan Cregan, uh, Deputy Chief Executive and Director of Finance and Resources of Belfast City Council. So I'm going to now hand over to Jackie and ask Jackie, would you please brief the committee? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee on behalf of Solis and I. And as you said, this is really a briefing in relation to the financial impact that COVID-19 has had and indeed continues to have on local councils in Northern Ireland. Um, you'll all be aware of the paper, the detailed paper that we have submitted to the committee. Um, and in addition, we provided a response to a number of questions that had been raised in your correspondence dated the 14th of May. If you're happy, Chair, I hope to provide a brief overview of our paper, um, just to introduce uh, the topic for the committee. And I suppose in terms of where we're at um, as local councils, we're very much into recovery mode at the minute. And our primary objective is to try and meet the needs and the expectations of our residents and ratepayers within our current, but indeed in terms of planning for the future, our future financial constraints and financial sustainability. It's important to say that we as chief executives recognize that councils have a key role to play in terms of the social and the economic and environmental recovery within our communities post the COVID-19 pandemic. But to achieve this, 
we have to have a sustainable funding model in place to support that. We recognise that the current situation that we all find ourselves in is unprecedented and I suppose it is really important to acknowledge the support that has been given to the councils to date. It has been very much appreciated um, by the council elected members and with the senior officers and it has allowed us to remain solvent at this stage and to continue to provide critical services to the end of June 2020. And just to touch on those, um, Chair, as a reminder, obviously there was a significant sum that came from the department, £20.3 million in respect of lost income and emergency expenditure. Um, we've had £3.8 million from DERA in relation to waste management, £1.5 million of community support. Um, and again, I think it's really important to recognise the community effort um, which has been put in place and has been facilitated by councils and by the department in responding to those who have been most in need and most impacted by the pandemic. We've had access to the coronavirus job retention scheme, which again has really assisted our cash flow. Um, we have the scheme of emergency financial assistance and we also have the town centre revitalisation scheme. So those things are all really, really welcomed by everyone within local councils. We are in the process of preparing a quarter two bid in relation to lost income, etc. And we do hope to submit that to the department next week. So that's a work in progress, but we're concluding that as we speak. We understand that the committee is already aware of the issues that relate to loss of income. Um, and I think this afternoon what we really want to focus on is the impact that the predicted economic downturn will have in terms of us trying to set our rates for the next two years and probably beyond that period as well. If we, if as we expect, councils end up in a significant deficit position at the end of this financial year, one of two things, or, or both of these things may happen. So our reserves, um, in some cases, would be eroded. And there would be a need to factor in that deficit um, into our budget next year in terms of monies that would need to be repaid or owed to land and property services. So that's a significant point um, that we want to try and get across this afternoon. In addition to that, as a result of the economic downturn, we do estimate that our penny product, which is our income from the rates, will drop significantly um, next year and probably in the following year as well. And that's why as part of our paper today and our, the report that we've provided to uh, the members of the committee, we're asking that rates be paid to councils moving forward uh, based on the estimated amount that was agreed as part of the rate setting process at the start of this financial year. And we're asking for that for the next two years. We're also asking for continued support in terms of losses of income, emergency expenditure and additional waste management costs for quarter two, again for this financial year and beyond. And the, the reason why we're doing that is really important because, as I said earlier, we need to, be, to have this financial stability so that we can fully play our role in the economic, social and e environmental recovery of our local communities. And ultimately, what we need to do is avoid what we estimate to be between a 20% and a 30% rates increase next year because you can imagine the devastating impact that that would have on local businesses um, within the community as well. So just to, to sum up, as I said earlier, the big challenge for us is to try and meet the needs and the expectations of our residents and our ratepayers, including local businesses, within the current and future financial uh, constraints. Without the interventions that we've referred to um, earlier, it would be very difficult to sustain this and hard choices would have to be made in terms of how we reduce costs and that would impact on the service delivery and our ability to assist with recovery. So, Chair, thank you for listening. Um, I know that you and your committee colleagues will have um, some questions for us. I also know that Suzanne Wiley, who chairs the Economic Recovery Committee within SOLAS and um, within local government, does want to say a little bit about the economic recovery piece. Um, but I'll leave it in your hands as how you would like to progress um, the question and, answer, question and answer session. So thank you very much.
Okay, thank you, Jackie. Um, I think we'll just hear from Suzanne um, on the back of you before we start questions. So, Suzanne, if you want to go ahead. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much and good afternoon um, to all the members of the committee. Um, Jackie's obviously given a, a very good summary of the position of, of where we are financially in local government. I just wanted to emphasise um, a few points about um, not only um, the impact um, on the council's ability to deliver um, its key services, which it is statutorily obliged to do, um, but also um, the ability of councils to contribute to the overall regional recovery um, plan, uh, and uh, obviously um, to help um, us all to build back better. So councils are at the minute um, focused on both um, short-term support um, and, all, and also longer-term uh, recovery plans. Um, I'm going to, to pick a few areas just as examples um, so you can get a flavour of why it is so important um, that we're able to plan financially um, over the next two, two uh, to three years um, to really support um, regional recovery. Um, so, for example, if you take um, the city deals that and growth deals um, that are being rolled out um, across Northern Ireland, um, you'll be aware that they are um, that they are being brought forward to create more jobs and to, to boost productivity. So they are a big lever in terms of uh, recovery, um, and they have a focus on digital connectivity, um, on innovation, on uh, infrastructure, and tur tourism and skills development um, as well. Um, however, they do depend on councils to contribute financially. Um, alongside both uh, the Treasury and um, the Executive. So, for example, in the Belfast Region City Deal, the Council's contribution amounts to £100 million, um, which then is added into the overall pot, pot of £850 million. Um, However, if we, don't, um, if we aren't able to achieve uh, the level of rates income that was planned and is needed to build up these funds on the local authority side, then these projects could, could actually falter. And obviously that would deliver another um, big blow to future economic potential as well. Um, councils are also very focused on supporting business start um, ups and um, business growth um, as well, entrepreneurship programmes, skills development programmes um, too, uh, and we are concerned that more investment is clearly needed in these areas um, to protect uh, jobs and also to create new jobs, not only from InvestNI and from the Department for the Economy, but also through councils themselves who do contribute um, significant investment in these areas. And again, this is something that can only happen if we're not starved uh, of cash um, through a crash in the rate space. Uh, investing in our local towns and um, villages and cities, obviously something that um, this committee is, is concerned about um, as well. Um, jointly, uh, we invest with DFC to revitalise them. And uh, particularly at the minute, we're focused on helping um, customer-focused businesses to open up again in our towns, villages and cities. The £10 million pounds that Jackie mentioned earlier as part of the revitalisation programme is incredibly welcome. But this... Um, has to be matched with Council's ability uh, to continue investment alongside this, um, particularly investment in our own assets um, and also in partnership with either the public sector and uh, or the private sector, um, which um, Councils have been much more adept in, in recent years in partnering with the private sector. Um, and for example, we're investing um, in new innovation districts and new enterprise parks, um, new neighbourhood um, developments as well, new tourism and cultural venues across our local areas. And this is really what, what is known as place shaping um, and uh, is really a fundamental role of local government um, in uh, the recovery uh, agenda, but it really requires councils to have sufficient funds to invest in these areas. Um, on the point just of future growth in towns and cities, it is worth noting that Solis and Milga have both called for a high street fund of significance for longer term um, revitalisation of our high streets, similar to the levels um, that uh, were announced um, some time back in England um, and which could be used alongside council assets and investment programmes. 
Um, you mentioned earlier um, culture and arts and the presentations that have been made to you um, by uh, that sector. You'll know that councils do work alongside um, the department in investing culture in arts and events and supporting capacity building in that sector as well. Um, however, if there is a significant downturn in our rates income um, then over the next few years, it's unlikely that we will be able to invest in any discretionary areas such as this, as there will be focus um, on uh, our mandatory services. Um, and this will include grant programmes, and it will really mean that demands on the department um, would um, be even greater than they are today. And the same applies to um, community provision, community support and community grants, um, as councils do invest in these areas um, alongside DFC um, as well. Um, so investing in facilities, regeneration schemes, um, uh, community programs um, to improve community well-being, something which is even more important uh, in terms of our way out of this particular crisis. So in short, and to summarise, um, councils um, do really need to have this security of a level of rates income uh, over the next um, few years to enable us really to um, uh, plan for investment in all of these areas. Um, which will be vital to the region's recovery and uh, will save as many jobs as we possibly can, create new ones that support um, both the cultural sector and community wellbeing. Thank you very much, Committee. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. Um, and before I open to members, I'll just ask a few questions. Um, uh, start off with yourself, Jackie. Um, we know that the, um, a, lot of, there, a lot more things are opening up, up now. Um, within our council sector, whether that is our golf clubs, whether that is hopefully our gyms opening up as well, and various other venues. And, you know, there might be a bit of a misconception out there that because of that, funds will be generated. Um, but I know as an ex-council member that that's often very different. Um, it's just to ask you, Jackie, sort of going forward, we know that you're preparing for the second bit at the moment. Um, so um, we know that 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 you are working hard on that. Do you see then this bid that there will be a third bid and a fourth bid um, because um, councils will not be back to that level of income um, that they previously had in in it, but certainly within the next final or this financial year. Yeah. Yes, chair. Obviously, we are planning to reopen a lot of services, but as we do so. Um, particularly given the requirements of social distancing. Um, we will start to bring in some income, but at the same time, we'll have to bring staff back um, from furlough. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation in terms of, you know, paying for the paying for the service and paying for those staff. I know that Alfie's um, involved in more detail in preparing the um, quarter two bid, um, but I think, that, you know, the members need to be mindful that as we reopen services, we will have some income, but I think that will be offset with the additional cost in relation to social distancing and actually um, losing some of the income that we're currently getting to cover staff costs through furlough. But Alfie may want to elaborate slightly on that. Go ahead, Alfie, if you can. Yes, um, absolutely. So I suppose just putting in context, if we take the example of leisure and how it's currently been funded for the first quarter, the 60% funding from DFC is effectively funding 60% of our losses. The other 40% has been effectively recouped through the furlough scheme. And as Jackie has said, that reopening of facilities will effectively remove that element of, of, of funding from us. I think another really important point to put is there are upfront costs associated with reopening facilities. These are facilities that have been closed for a couple of months that require health and safety checks carried out and, and, and works to bring the premises back to operation use and also the staffing of those facilities there's more supervision will be required um, and new ways of working for staff you know which will place you know pressure on the staff budgets as as, the, as they sit so we see reopening of facilities to be an additional cost pressure for us in the, in the short term we are working very hard on collating the quarter two claim and the data will be back from all the councils this week and we will be summarizing that and and submitting it through solace and the finance officers group and to um, the department um, next week um, so we, we do still expect a significant bid for the reasons I've highlighted. You know, there are other service areas such as planning and building control, which are really important income contributors for us. And, you know, we've been doing work this week in relation to building control. 
and there's been a 60% reduction effectively in the income in the, in the month of June and the number of applications we're receiving and that's a very significant financial impact for us and that impact could even increase next quarter as the as the economic impact potentially takes further hold. So we are planning in an environment of significant uncertainty but one in, in which I think we we can say with no doubt that, that our income is going to be significantly impacted in the short to medium term and possibly a very long time before it's restored to our budgeted levels. Okay, thank you, Alfie, for that. And just following on that, the issue to do with staffing and the issue to do with furloughing. Um, uh, as you said, Jackie, uh, some of those staff are going to have to come back, probably especially within the leisure industry. Um, can you just, uh, in your um, submission to us, there was a line in it that said it should be noted that not all staff who are furloughed are eligible for the, corona, the coronavirus job retention scheme. Um, can you give me an example of staff that were furloughed that weren't in, in, entitled to that? And were they being paid uh, by councils? And if so, where was that money coming from? Yes, uh, Chair, that's a very good question. Um, I suppose that some councils um, had staff who um, were maybe not providing essential services that were um, funded through income. And those staff maybe weren't required to come in and provide those essential services, but they wouldn't be eligible for funding through the job retention scheme. My understanding is that that scheme is only available to staff who were funded through income that was coming through that was generated separate to the rates money. I'm quite happy to go back and do a further analysis on that, Chair, if you think that would be helpful. Yeah, it, just, it, it, it kind of stuck out, it, it struck a chord with me as to why um, were people furloughed if they weren't entitled to the job retention scheme, because that was the, the whole point in that. And who are these staff? Where are they? You know, who, if that is their, where their sole income or the, sole, uh, the money to pay those staff was coming from income. Just how that worked out. So if you could maybe we could get more information on that for committee, that would be good as well. Um, and then I just want to ask you, Jackie, around the um, the guaranteed uh, rates income. And I I know from those years sitting in council and having to go through striking the rate and the penny product, and it still strikes me with fear. Um, so I mean, I fully understand why councils require um, that certainty in order to plan ahead. They can't plan ahead without that certainty. Um, just to ask you what um, conversations you've had with the department on that, and I suppose it's a, a, look as a committee as well how we can help with that as well if, uh, after this briefing. But so just really to ask, what's your conversations you've had and how's that been received? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yes, we have had conversations at a very high level, um, I suppose in terms of the, the size of the ask in a sense. Um, when you look across the 11 councils, the total level of income that comes in is in around £850 million, and £700 million of that comes through the rates, so it is significant. I think one of the challenges for us in terms of having the conversation with the department and with yourselves is the availability of data from LPS. So we, we do intend to engage quite heavily with them around trying to get that data and to, you know, to help us to plan accordingly. So the conversations are beginning. I suppose the focus to date has been around the quarter one and the quarter two claims in relation to loss of income and the additional costs that we had incurred. So that is something that we do intend to take forward. Um, eminently. And just finally, one more question, so maybe one that you could maybe answer as well, Suzanne. Um, following on, I, I don't know if you heard us the earlier part of this meeting when you were waiting to come in, where we had a meeting with the arts sector. On some of us in the room had a meeting with the arts sector on Monday, um, and they they had brought up the possibility of the government, uh, whenever theatres are able to open, um, that there's going to have to be subsidies uh, or subsidi you're going to have to subsidise that in some way in order for anybody who works within the arts sector to be able to make a living. Um, and I know that our theatres in many of our council um, owned, owned theatres are subsidised already by the ratepayer. Um, so uh, just your opinion on that, maybe, Suzanne, would that require, and I know in Belfast um, there are various theatres um, throughout Belfast, and we know we want to see people back whenever they feel confident to come back and take part in that. So just your ideas around that um, on how you think that would work. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll maybe bring Ronan into this as well. I mean, um, obviously, um, for um, theatres um, or any cultural venues um, to... Uh, wash their face, um, they need to get um, people through the door and ticket sales, etc. So 
um, if they can't fill all the seats, that's going to be um, really difficult for them to be viable um, in the longer term. Um, so yes, they, they, they will need a subsidy in my view. I mean, we obviously have our own venues. Um, we have uh, here in Belfast with the waterfront, Jackie has her own um, theatre um, as well um, at the mill. Uh, and uh, uh, they are clearly, we've been looking at the financial position there, uh, they're clearly not going to bring as much income uh, in through the door um, in the early years and will require additional subsidies. There's no doubt about that. Roland, do you want to comment? I mean, it's just to say that, uh, I mean, as a council, we've continued to pay core multi-annual funding to all the culture um, organisations that we fund, so that our budgets and the funding hasn't been cut in relation to that. Um, big thing is now is obviously, I mean, they can't absorb the level of income losses, um, with, particularly with social distancing, their audience levels will be reduced. So they needed, a lot of them need subsidy before this, so they will need it even more after it. And, our ability, and the point that Ron's making about um, additional funding, programme funding and, and capacity funding for core costs, etc. Um, through this core multi-annual funding programme that we provide, um, that's discretionary. So um, if we can't maintain the level um, of our rates base, um, which is our big concern going forward, then we won't be able to provide that level of, of subsidy. So it's not just um, in terms of the actual venues, but also uh, support for capacity in the sector as well could be severely uh, affected. And we do know uh, that um, you know, all businesses are not going to survive. Um, I think there is an issue in terms of um, an understanding of local government finance and an understanding of uh, how we're so dependent on our rate base and particularly our, our commercial um, rate base, the business rates, and what it will mean if a number of businesses um, uh, can survive, uh, what that impact that will then have on council finances um, and the investment in recovery in all sectors. And I suppose that's absolutely right when we come to the revitalisation of our, our towns and, and villages and city centres. Um, we see that all of the work that has been done in the past, great work that has been done, and we look at, at the work that you have planned for the future. And if we are going to, if we're looking at giving a rate a hike of 20 to 30 percent, many businesses will never ever survive that. Um, and not, not even talking about homeowners um, who um, may 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 find it difficult and may fall into the rates arrears certainly. But you know, it doesn't make sense for uh, for us as a government to have put so much money into businesses over this COVID period and looking at revitalisation, and then to um, th then to, to to not give councils the wherewithal um, uh, and leave councils with no other choice but to to put that twenty percent hike on. I, I assume, Jackie, going back to you again, that argument has been well and truly made with the department. Yes, it has, Chair, and it's probably one that we could, will continue to make and, and to make in whatever form uh, we, can, we can make that argument. I think it's important to um, acknowledge the work that NILGA are doing as well in terms of the connections that they have with the various departments and ministers um, within the Assembly as well. So we're very clearly we're working together. We all have the same strategy and hopefully we're all communicating the same message. So yes, I think that you, know, you actually hit the nail on the head when you said that businesses would not be able to, to survive a rates increase at that level, and I think that's a really key point in terms of the messaging. Okay. Yeah, Chair, can I just yeah, say as well, I mean, the big issue in this is to actually be able to quantify the ask. So at the minute we are asking for the guarantee for this year and for the next two years, but um, to do that you need to understand the rate base and LPS hold the rate base in terms of the valuation and um, the billing list. So what we really need from LPS is a serious look now at the economic model. And there's a direct correlation between the economy and rates. So if the economy is going down, your rates will go down. So what we need to really understand for next year is um, looking at different economic recovery models and assess that against the impact of the rate base. So um, our problem is, for this year, we would not know until next June um, if we were in a clawback position with land property services. And there's no way that we can financially model that in this, the current circumstances. Next year, if we pay 
have to pay back, it will have to come from reserves, which at that stage will probably be already be depleted. And for the following two years, in terms of Department of Finance, there needs to be a real understanding um, be well before the rate is set about what the potential um, losses are going, to, are going to be. So like in Belfast, this year we would lose, as a city, 34.7 million of rates income through vacant properties, um, exclusions and debt. And we can only see that going up and up and up in terms of the, the value of the losses. Thank you, um, Ronan, for that. And, and again, just one more final question. Final question. Um, um, I, I assume that within your your council meetings that are that are taking place, um, with uh, whether that's remote council meetings or meetings with your council, uh, the leaders of the groups on those councils, I, I assume that all parties are, are of, of you know of the same opinion that we need to keep the the. We, we, do, we certainly don't want to go near a 20% rates increase. I mean, I, I'm assuming that, that amongst that all parties are, are wanting to do what's very best for those towns and villages, for their ratepayers, for those businesses. Um, is that Would that be correct in saying that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, that, that is totally unpalatable uh, and certainly could end up putting businesses out of business in, its, in itself. Um, so... Uh, that is not somewhere where local councillors want to go, which is why um, this ask um, has come forward to central government um, asking for uh, the rate base at the current levels to be protected this year and for, for two future years. Okay, thank you. I'm going to open up to members before I ask any more questions. Um, uh, Kelly, you first. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Susanne, it just ties in quite nicely to um, what I wanted to ask you about. Um, Jackie had mentioned in, in the discussion um, that what the level of income from rates this year and over the next two years, do you have a predicted model of what that is to be expected over the next two years? And I'm just wondering how up to date is that given the hit on reserves? that councils have had to have, um, is there anything there that you've had to revise on that? And I noticed in the presentation that I think there's due to be um, an update to DFC by August 2020. I'm, I'm assuming that the financial statements will include then the amended reserve level in that document? So yes, the financial statements, which are um, obviously year-end year um, accounts, etc., they will look at um, the reserve levels as well, so those will be submitted. Um, I'm going to bring Ronan in um, just uh, to talk about the future modelling, because um, it's something he has really focused on in detail um, over the last few months, um, and I think he can give you quite a bit of insight into that and a few examples. So, I mean, in terms, in terms of this year, I mean, and Alfie can testify this, I mean, our budgets now, we have to do um, every single month now, a line-by-line line review, looking at the actual figures and then also doing a revision of the budgeted figures because the rate is set against the budget, um, not against the actual figures. So every single line and every single budget is being reviewed and tested against the assumptions that have been made. And on that basis, then, each council has to make decisions about how they're going to um, meet their deficit. And the point will be is if you don't have sufficient reserves, then that becomes becomes a major, major issue. But for the next the next two years, I mean, as um going to do a presentation to Solus in a couple of weeks about the model that we have been looking at in terms of forecasting the rates impact um for the next two years. But it is a very complex model because you have to look at um the rate base in its entirety in terms of will there be new buildings coming in um, to the rate base next year? Will there be buildings going out in terms of exclusions? What will be the impact on businesses in terms of, will that manifest itself in an increase in the number of vacant properties? Vacant properties only pay 50% non-domestic. Will there be an increase in the amount of um, properties that are excluded from rates or are exempt from paying rates? Um, and then the model and around the level of debt, both on a non-domestic level and a domestic level. So, and then you also, even if we, um, that increase that Jackie had talked about, I mean, that increase is just to stand still. It doesn't then account for uh, how if there's an example, a uh, 2% pay raise will cost um, the council two or three million pounds. That has to be found from somewhere. So it's not just the modeling 
of the rate base, then it's a modeling of what um, the impact will be. We are also on our own income levels. Will demand be less? So the income that we get through fees and charges and use of facilities, will they go down next year as well? So it's a whole cocktail of forecasting. But the base of that is 75% of is, it, is the rates. So, um, and I do think there's a big issue around data sharing in that we can get uh, the valuation list from non-property services, but we can't get the billing list. So we would know a property on a certain street, but we didn't, don't know who owns it. We don't know um, what type of shop it is. So there's a lot more work to be done in terms of how we're going to cross um, work with land property services. Thank you. I know that um, us as a committee here are very supportive of um, a new funding model for councils, and, and I know that um, we'd got response back from communities about the partnership panel. Um, certainly, I know in the new decade, new approach negotiations at the earlier part of this year that the long term um, funding strategy would be long term funding um, to ensure that there is more certainty. It also allows more planning. Um, my concern would be if we hit 20 to 30 percent rates. To be honest, after coronavirus, when we've had so many people have lost their jobs and businesses have struggled and councils have struggled, um, you can say 30% rates increase, but if you're not actually getting the payment, and then it's pointless to have that. Um, I'm just wondering, with the Department of the Economy, um, have they fed into discussions that you guys have been having um, with communities and about this model, this funding model and partnership panel? Yeah, we have approached we have approached all of the departments um, about this particular issue. Um, um, uh, co communities, um, finance, um, and uh, economy, and of course we've been working with LPS um, as well extensively. Um, uh, Ronan and Alfie have been involved in, in many many meetings with them to look at um, these models and predict different scenarios um, as well. But but regardless of that, we do know that um, by the end of this. Um, financial year, um, you know, de um, and obviously depending on um, how much um, reimbursement um, councils can actually secure in quarter two and quarter three, etc., for loss of income, um, and uh, and what uh, continues to happen with with the rates release scheme over this um, next year, mm -hmm. um, and also how much savings we can make, because you've seen in the paper councils um, are making savings in in areas. Um, right across the board as well, because um, we obviously have to make a contribution ourselves. Um, but we feel we will be in a deficit um, situation. We will have to dip into reserves. The extent of that still um, is, is being worked out for each individual council. Um, and we have estimates of that. Um, though that money can only be spent once, because clearly reserves are, are cash reserves, and when that money is spent, they're gone. Um, and then it has to be made up through the rates in future years um, as well. So you, you're, you know, you're starting off with deficit. But I think our big ask really um, is that um, we're asking for the level that we set our rate at this year. So the income that councils are getting in through that. Uh, rate base this year, and 75% of our income that comes from the, the, the rates base um, across the 11 councils, that is that quantum um, that is protected for the next um, uh, for this year and the next two years so that we can adequately plan for our services and recovery. Yeah. And my final question. Um... <laughs> You obviously, we have been talking to different sectors, the Arts Council, Sport NI, um, and there's an, there is an overlap in some of the work that councils do um, in that you both, you know, you're dealing with artists, you're dealing with theatres, you're dealing with different sports, and there has been development um, across Northern Ireland with councils and those sectors hand in hand. I'm just wondering, you've talked about making savings, and... The future is going to be very difficult for councils going forward. I absolutely accept that because of the economic position that you're in. I'm just wondering, is has there been a discussion with those sectors as to the development of their funding programmes to ensure that there isn't duplication going forward and that you're all driving towards the same outcome? And is the Department of Communities helping you with that discussion? Um, not not aware of any specific discussions so far, but I think it's important to stress what Suzanne said earlier. If, if councils are left to make the really difficult decisions, um, 
around finances moving forward, we will have some really hard choices to make in terms of our essential and statutory services and the things that are more discretionary. But I think, you know, the point that you've made today is a really good one in terms of trying to join those conversations up with the department and just to make sure that there isn't any duplication. So we'd be quite happy to pick that up following today. And can I just finally just say thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the situation that you're in. Your staff have had to deal with, my goodness, what a, an awful time working and then being put into furlough and those that aren't furloughed and are still working every day, as many of us are. Um, but um, I was a former councillor with, with Ards and then Ards in North Down. I appreciate that. Um, and the bins are still being picked up. The cemeteries are still being looked after. Councils are still there in the background. The food parcel scheme has been fantastic, and thank you for that. But hopefully we'll be able to get a plan going forward that we don't see um, the end to a lot of council services. We certainly don't want to see a 30% increase in the rates. So thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I don't have any other members who wish to... Sorry, Robin, you want to come in? Can I just remind members that are on Starleaf if they can press their hands up button so to make me aware that they want to speak? Go ahead, Robin. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I, don't, I don't actually have any questions uh, towards the, the, the panel, and I, I thank uh, each of them uh, for, for coming uh, before us again today. I think just in looking at what the support requested is, Chair, I suppose I would understand their difficulty in the rate setting in the current situation. And I do understand that the business community at this time, and indeed householders, need to have some assurances and to be talking about stability for the way in the way forward, particularly in the business community. I said this, Chair, at the last meeting, with the, uh, the delegation, that we need a positive partnership with the councils. And that positive partnership really does, uh, in my humble opinion, Chair, does not, and we should not see Solus having to come every quarter to make a presentation to us uh, on, on what they will need. Uh, to take the, 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 the councils forward and provide that uh, stability in the community. So I certainly would be encouraging, Chair, through you um, at the end of this meeting, that we would encourage uh, the councils and LPS to work together to develop this uh, robust rates forecasting model that, that the, the delegation ha have spoken about. It's absolutely critical, and I agree with the, the, the chair. It's absolutely sorry with the deputy chair. It's absolutely critical that we need to continue the the, the, the council services. My goodness, at a, at a, for the short period in Belfast when there was a problem with uh, bin collection, and that was only one item, uh, and if that was multiplied up a number of times, then you can imagine uh, the, the, the the feeling out, out in the community. I think, Chair, we also need to encourage where there is the need to, uh, and I think it was Ronan who mentioned the, the government initiatives around City Deal uh, and how we can help uh, bring any aspect that's within communities forward. But I do think, Chair, the three points that the delegation have raised are absolutely essential, uh, and we should be talking about not the next quarter, but indeed, for at least the next two financial years, Chair, uh, and I would be supportive of the, 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 the support requested. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Robin. Um, I've got then Fra McCann and then Sinead Innes waiting to come in next. So, Fra McCann, you're next. Can you hear us, Fra? No. No, nope, well then we'll take Fra off and then we'll bring Sinead in. Sinead. Sinead, can you can hear you, us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can now. Go ahead, Sinead. Okay, thank you, Chair, um, and thanks to um, to the guys for the briefing there. Um, you know, it's clearly it's been clearly articulated by by the um by everyone who spoke there that you know the, how de the devastating impact the COVID has had. 
Um, but I think it's also presented a lot of um, opportunities um, and opportunities to maybe do things a wee bit differently. Um, and I, my question would be um, whether any SOLAS uh, members, any member councils um, in conjunction with the Department for Infrastructure um, are considering, for example, the pedestrianisation of any streets within their district um, you know, to enable businesses to operate differently and to help them with their economic revitalisation. Uh, Jackie? Um, I'll probably let Suzanne speak on this one because I know that it is something specific that Belfast are doing. Um, Belfast um, are looking at this. In fact, we have a council meeting tonight and there will be um, a approval um, for a, a number of streets listed um, tonight um, to pedestrianise those, those streets. In fact, um, some of them have already happened in the cathedral. Um, quarter. Uh, it is something we're very focused on um, because the hosp hospitality industry um, is going to depend on us being able to provide more space and, and we're grateful to the department as well for um, coming to the Department for Communities coming forward and offering some of its public space as well that we can utilise. Um, so we have been working across the 11 councils to try and be as consistent as possible. Um, here um, we've developed a protocol for pavement cafe licensing um, and to allow um, those pavement cafes to be set up whilst um, applications are being processed as well. So we've been working with all departments, um, so DFC, DFI um, and the PSNI on that particular issue and also looking at road closure legislation with DFI um, as well. So I think you will see uh, a lot more of those proposals coming forward um, from all 11 councils. Um, thanks, Suzanne. And Tara, if I just have a wee follow-up, those um, proposals that you're saying, Suzanne, are going to be given the green light tonight, are they temporary or are they permanent or maybe a mixture of both? Um, they are temporary at this point in time. And obviously the proposal, the, the council can't do this itself, it's DFI. And clearly the proposal is to call on DFI um, to look at these particular streets, but also in consultation with the business community as well, because there are you know, many... Um, uh, different implications um, of closing off particular areas and the timings of closures, etc., are important as well. Um, some of them may suit nighttime closures um, as opposed to daytime closures. So um, it's important that it's done in consultation with with um, those communities. Um, that isn't to say, though, that that can't lead on to some um, more permanent um, closures where those work. But I think it's worth testing some of that out. Um, initially, um, and also making sure that um, we link those in with longer term plans for revitalising our towns and city centres um, as well, which will include some pedestrian, some more pedestrianisation or semi pedestrianisation. Okay, that's great, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Um, Fra, do you want to try? Fra, are you there? Can you hear me? I can indeed. Fra, go ahead. Sure. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. That was frantically waving at the, at the screen, probably waving at itself. But I would like to thank the delegate for the uh, presentation. I thought it was good. And it was, um, when the, the, the officials were speaking, uh, the, one of the slogans that's been used uh, came to mind, we're all in this together. And I think nothing could be truer. And I think uh, that uh, it's something we need to keep in mind as we move forward uh, in, the, in the presence of this virus, but when we, we're moving out of it, and I think that's a crucial element of it, uh, how we manage uh, the, 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 the moving out of the virus uh, and everything. And I know we've mentioned business, we've mentioned that, but the, the bottom of all this is, is the rate pairs themselves and uh, the, the impact that this is having at present on them, uh, mental, on their mental well-being. And as we move out, as, as things may uh, get more difficult financially, uh, the impact then, so they, they need to be keep in mind that uh, the, the, the double digit raise and rates uh, would have a huge impact on 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 that. So I uh, know it's not an it's not an easy task. Just two questions, but most of the questions have been asked been asked. And I think that's the joys of being sure and face sure uh, that you, you get to ask all the, all the good questions at the at the the, the, the start. So uh, one uh, and it's in terms of borrowing. Uh, has uh, the has Solus or the councils uh, made approaches to the Department of Finance and spoke about borrowing, uh, especially making approaches to the the Treasury, and ask have they uh, could they could they uh, borrow? Uh, my understanding is that uh, that 
Uh, borrowing is probably at its cheapest rate, and especially if you borrow over the long term. And uh, could, could that be one uh, uh, option uh, out of it? But I would emphasize that uh, we all have a responsibility, both at local government and regional government, uh, to, to ensure that the, uh, the, the, that, uh, that we meet on a regular basis. They understand uh, what people are saying about bringing people along, but the only information that we get is when people come and do their presentations. The fact that there's 11 councils, and this is the second question, the fact that there's 11 councils, uh, not uh, all of them would be operating at the same speed as maybe as some of the bigger councils, and it's essential that we bring everybody along uh, in this year. And uh, our people uh, working uh, for a recovery plan and uh, our people that may not have the wherewithal uh, to, to, to complete a full recovery plan, are they getting all the assistance and help and financially and other uh, to prepare those plans? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, yes, the, the count, there's 11 councils and they're all very, very different. And if you look at Belfast as an example, a large city, huge population, lots of services, and try and compare that to some of the rural areas, obviously the rate of recovery is going to be different. Mm -hmm. And we're very mindful of that rural isolation and the whole community piece that you've just talked about there. It is really important to us. So there is a group working on recovery plans in terms of internal council services. And then, as I said earlier, Suzanne's working on it with a group about external recovery and the economy and all of that good stuff. Um, you had a specific question about borrowing and again I think all of the councils are in different places in terms of borrowing as well because we can only borrow money for certain purposes and um, there are restrictions around that and of course the money has to be paid back as well so you know from my own council's point of view we, we have extended our overdraft and we, we think we have enough cash in place uh, to keep us going until around the end of October so different councils in different positions there as well so hopefully that answers your question yeah so th 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 there is no way that all councils can come together and uh look at how they can bar, bar substantial amounts of money that could see them uh through this thing yep as, as you said yourself you know borrowing is really really uh cheap at the minute but as opposed to it collectively you know there would be a difficulty around how then the repayments etc would be made between the the different councils but ronan or alfie might want to comment further on that as our financial experts yep um i'm happy to come in um jackie as you've mentioned our Borrowing from government can only really be done in two, two circumstances, number one for capital projects or number two for expenditure, which has been deemed um, for savings, you know, which is a long term benefit, which we require a capitalization direction for. Um, so that's effectively spreading upfront revenue costs over a number of years to allow the immediate savings to be realized. Um, there's a business case being worked through with the Department for Communities at the minute in relation to um, basically approving capitalization directions for councils as they come up to the rates process um, this year. In terms of that wider borrowing for capital projects, I know all the councils are PWLB rates were recently increased by 1% as a result of UK councils and you know borrowing for more commercial ventures and we have been punished by that in Northern Ireland. So what we have been starting to look at as the 11 Northern Ireland councils is effectively bonds issues and things like that where we could come together collectively and go out to the market and hopefully secure cheaper rates than are presently on offer from PWLB and that bit of work was just commenced in advance of the whole COVID situation and we're really looking to proactively pick that up again. Um, one other point that I would make that is important in terms of borrowing, uh, and I think every council is impacted by this, we have a lot of old loans on our books that are going to be an overhead for us for quite some time, and they are at very, very high interest rates. And we have had conversations over the last number of years which are very difficult to progress around refinancing those loans at current interest rates, but currently there's a redemption penalty in place that doesn't make that viable 
and worthwhile. So conversations are ongoing with Department of Finance in that regard, but certainly it's another opp opportunity. Um, I suppose the, the strategy in this council to date has been to free up as much funds as we can through our efficiency plan to borrow and invest in new capital projects that will grow and and uh, grow our city region uh, alongside all the city deal projects that we're trying to progress as well. Sure, could I just ask one final question? And it's in the round early. I know that uh, the delegation had said that they have been working with different departments. How's there, how are those relationships? I know that uh, in normal times, they, 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 they can be difficult. As everybody pulling together, understanding and realizing that uh, the, the, the goal in this is not only uh, bringing this fast to an end, uh, but a, a recovery plan that can see us at the other end of it. I think it's fair to say that relationships are very good, that they always are very good. But I suppose from the council's point of view, um, we're maybe competing with other asks in terms of funds that might be available for health or education or, or whatever. So, yes, we, you know, relationships are good. We keep in touch with the various officials in various departments. Um, we keep communicating our issues and our needs to them. But obviously, we're competing with other organisations that also have demands on their resources. I think, Fred, to just to add to what Jackie has said, I think it's been a lot easier. Relationships have been good. It's been a lot easier um, for the focus to be on shorter term issues um, and the immediate needs and how we're going to get through those. Um, what we need to get to now is that joined up co-design approach between central government um, and local government in terms of all aspects of recovery, whether that's community recovery that you've talked about, whether that's economic recovery, how we deal with the environment, et cetera, um, going forward. So it's that co-design um, approach that we would really be asking for. Thank you very much. And thank you very much again for the presentation. Good luck. Thank you, Fred. Okay, there's no thank other you. members have... Um, Risen their hands at the moment to say that they want to come back. I'm just double checking on it. Nope, nothing at the moment. Okay, so I just want to say a big thank you um, to uh, Jackie, Suzanne, um, Ronan, and Alfie um, for coming back in with us today. Um, I, I I agree with Robin. I would love it if we didn't have to have you in. That we knew that. Uh, Not that, that we don't want to see you. <laughs> yeah, we know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we do like to see your bright, smiling faces. Um, but uh, yeah, we would absolutely love it if we didn't have to hold these these briefings, and that we knew that that um, rates had been secured, and that you knew that you were on the right path forward. But um, I all been well, um, or all being whatever. Um, come back in September. I would hope that we'd maybe have you back at the end of September to give us an update on your second phase and how that has, um, the, how that has manifested. And then looking towards then the third phase of of, of possible funding then from the executive. So uh, if you have nothing further to add, I just want to say um, thank you for briefing the committee today. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay, members, I think then following on from that, um, we need to maybe put a pen to paper to a few of the departments. Um, I think not only our own minister, but also the Minister for Finance and the Minister for the Economy as well, um, uh, just for going forward for councils, especially around the issue of the the, uh, the rates guarantee um, and how that will look, uh, especially if you look for the uh, with the, the economy as well, going forward, if there is that <coughs> massive rates increase. Um, never mind how that's going to affect people in general and homeowners in general, um, but it will have a massive effect on the economy as well. So are members in an agreement then that we write then to um, not only our own minister, but Minister for Finance and Minister for the Economy? Yes, all agreed? Yes, yes agreed. Yeah, Chair, can you just ask on the, point, on the third point that the continued support for financial loss as a result of lost income, emergency procedure and waste management costs. Um, waste management costs, what... What is what is meant be meant by that? Uh, here? Um, bear with us a wee minute, do. Chair, I think if you refer to page nineteen of their sorry, if you look at page nineteen of the pack, okay. they refer to the funding that they got from DERA in respect yes, to waste management costs, which was three point eight million pounds. So I, I suspect what they're uh, getting at in relation to that is that 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 is uh, that is continued. That they received okay, so the it's so DERA as well as the, yeah. the ones you've already mentioned, Chair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. we can also uh, write to them also. Okay, uh, members. Sir, sir, just uh, in, in terms. <laughs> 
terms of the LPS to work with the councils, it just seems to be seems to me to be a no brainer that you do want this positive relationship, this positive engagement mm -hmm. in terms of taking Northern Ireland forward as a whole. Yeah. Uh, and that if the LPS have all, all the expertise, the knowledge, the forecasting, then what's wrong with the partnership with the council in doing that, delivering that service, Chair? Yeah, I agree. I don't understand it. Chair, perhaps in that we could just include a line about the data sharing element, which seems to be the stumbling block in that particular yeah. issue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right, members, are members happy enough then that we move on then to our next agenda item? Yeah? Okay. Um, Chair. Our next... Chair. Yeah, sorry. Who's that? Chair. Mark, is that you? It's Mark. I haven't gone away, you know. <laughs> Who are you? You've dialed in now. Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, I've I've been here all along. Sorry, chair, and I was sorry, I was trying I to get your attention. Your hands up sorry, I ah, sorry, sorry about that. No, well, well, most of the questions I suppose had been covered. You did uh, well then, and the answers were very uh, comprehensive as well. But just in terms of the the high street fund that was referred to there by Suzanne, and, and, and I know the delegation's gone now. Do we have any further information on that as to what the quantum of it was what exactly it is, is there a barn is consequential, what that is and when we could expect it? Okay Mark, I don't think we have that all of that information at hand but certainly we can get that information. Sure, I think the £10 million pounds recovery revitalisation scheme is, is central to the, the town centre and city recovery. Yeah. I'm not too sure if there's any additional monies on top of that, that have been released as yet. But we can oh, that's that a direct time. read across from the High Street Recovery Fund? Yes. Yeah. It appears to be, Mark, yes. Okay, and there was another issue, and, and I hope this isn't mis misconstrued in any way, and it, it, it is for the councils, obviously, but also for us, I think. And it's just, I'm sure other members and other constituencies will have come across it too, as we're dealing with uh, businesses and individuals who have been having difficulty accessing. Uh, the support packages out there, particularly the grants associated w w with, with rates, it has come as a, a huge shock to me, I suppose. The number of commercial uh, properties we have here in my constituency who uh, transpires haven't been paying rates, and I'm not saying I'll go out and hit them with a big bill tomorrow or next week or, or even next year, but it demonstrates to me, and I know uh, the councils there referred the working with the LPS and, and the need to do that. But there, I, I'd have to question how closely maybe they are working together currently or have been working to uh, up to this point, that, that, that there are properties like that that, that, that haven't been paying rates, that, that's income that councils and departments uh, are missing out on. And, and like I say, it's, it's by no means saying that they want to be crucifying business or giving them, them bigger bills. And, they're, they're, and you're obviously you're not talking, Mark, about people who are exempt from pen rates. No, no, I'm not. I'm not. No, okay. just a, a number, a significant number. I've come across some people just have have been waiting for LPS to come to them rather than them go to LPS. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I have. I, I, so I'm I not going to name names. <laughs> yeah, no, LPS please don't. LPS have their names. Now. Well, the LPS <laughs> have the details now because they've been looking for grants. Yeah, yeah, and therefore then that has excluded those people from applying for uh, rates relief and then the small business stuff Clearly, then? yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, so that, that's, that is an issue. But, but it's just a, it's a question mark over, I, I think, the relationship between the LPS and maybe council officers on the ground. I go back maybe 10 years, maybe even more. Uh, work has been done in the former Derry City Council area between the LPS and council, and that was around identifying vacant properties yeah. whenever uh, or prior to them starting be, being raided. And I don't know, did that relationship continue or did it just well around the vine, that working relationship? I know, and I know certainly with um, within councils, if you've got new businesses or a change of, of use of a business, you have, you'd have to go through um, planning, then some of the business you have to go through the, with the, the health and safety and various things. You know, any new businesses that have opened in recent years um, or even yeah. in the past 
10, 15 years. Um, so councils would be aware of all of those new businesses that have opened and those that have need change of use and various things. Um, it, it, that's quite shocking to learn that there are several or a lot of businesses out there that um, well, have been paying rates. Well, a significant number, surprisingly significant yeah. number is how I would put it that I've come across. Okay, all right. Well, that's maybe something that we need to um, maybe bounce that back to councils and ask them. Um, are they aware of, of a significant number of properties within their own council areas um, that there has been uh, no rates income on? I don't know if they would have that information, um, but yeah. it's maybe something that we can ask as well. No, that's okay. Oh, Mark, I apologise. I, I, I didn't realise that you weren't joining us via Starleaf, so that's why I didn't bring you in, so apologies. No, no worries. I will, no make, worries sure, I will make sure I ask you on our next briefing. Okay. I'm not, not, don't worry about it. I enjoyed last night. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mark, look, thank you. Um, so if there's nothing else then on item five, um, I'm going to move on then to agenda item six, which is a briefing by homelessness providers on the Supporting People programme. Uh, members, you'll find our brief at page 27 of your meeting packs. And then can I welcome Jim Dennison, Chief Executive of Simon Community NI, David Carroll, Chief Executive of DePaul, and Kevin Wright, Chief Executive of Housing First Housing Aid and Support Services. Um, so, Jim, I'm going to hand over to you, Jim, if you want to begin the presentation. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks to members of the committee for giving us a chance to, to speak to you. Um, there, uh, so, basically, what we wanted to do was uh, to tell a little bit about the organisations that we represent, uh, just to give a flavour of our size, our reach, and what we do. Uh, essentially, then, we want to split um, our inputs up. Um, Kevin from First Housing will say a few words uh, by way of a provider response to some evidence that was presented to you a couple of weeks ago from the Department of Communities and from the Housing Executive, uh, and specifically around our support and what that means for people, and as well as that around deficit funding, because both of those feature quite significantly uh, as part of that evidence. After that, then, David um, Carroll from DePaul will say a few words about the importance of health, and then I'll try and sum up and offer some ways in which we can end homelessness together. Um, so you, um, you've got three of us here, and actually, uh, unfortunately, Extern can't join us today, but we came together as a, a provider group at the start of the year, initially to make a response to a supporting people strategy that we felt needed a fair amount of work and reconsideration. Um, we worked then together through the unforeseen events that were COVID-19, um, and we worked very well, and we've been working together since. Um, before I hand over, I'll maybe say uh, a little bit about that. Um, but before I do, I mean, we to give you a sense of the size of our organisations, we represent about 60% of the charitable bed spaces here in Northern Ireland. Um, we manage about 800 emergency and temporary beds. So if you put all of those together in one space, it's bigger than the Royal Victoria Hospital. Um, so we, we have a significant size and reach. We also offer a variety of other services, including floating support, community outreach, mental health and addiction services, youth services, rehabilitation uh, support for those leaving the justice system, as well as tenancy uh, liaison support schemes. So whilst we're probably best known for our emergency accommodation or hostel provision, we do so much more than that. And we've supported around 9,000 people, uh, many of whom are very vulnerable over the last year. Um, to hopefully start off on a positive note before we get into some of the detail, uh, we have um, had a brilliant experience of multi-agency uh, work over COVID. COVID has been a nightmare for all of us, but I have to say the necessity to work differently really has borne a lot of fruit. Um, in February, we moved very, very quickly to establish a multi-agency group um, with um, ourselves, with the Department of Communities, the Housing Executive, the Health and Social Care Board, uh, the Public Health Agency, the RQIA, the Probation Board and PSNI. Um, and I chaired that group and I have to say I was delighted at the quick response and the things that we were able to do, things that we wouldn't have been able to do had we not have had the COVID pressure upon us. We were able to help and support the sector um, contain the spread and effect of COVID-19 through really, really detailed guidance. We were able to jointly lobby and secure additional funding resources, which have been a lifeline to many services. 
We were able to modify our services to put colleagues where they were most needed. We were able to secure new services, our new premises to house people uh, who were street homeless. And we were able to find new ways to handle and distribute controlled medication. And whilst that's a lot of the doing, the outworking of it was quite evident. Um, we were described, homeless hostels were described in The Guardian as potentially petri dishes for COVID-19. The sense is that if you get into a homeless hostel, it would spread like wildfire. Because of the work of and the commitment of our frontline staff, as well as all of the inputs from those agencies, we've come out of this relatively unscathed. We have not had any work close to the effect that we had uh, been worried about. We are not in a nursing home situation. Uh, and I think that that's down to three things. A little bit of luck, yes. Hard work, commitment, and joined up action. Um, and uh, as well as that, um, we just have had that commitment and that tenacity to get things done. And I suppose the reason I flag that is we have a real fear that after this COVID pressure that we're going to revert to type. We're going to fall into very disparate, disconnected policies. We're going to go to silo working. We're going to be at the mercy of continued funding cuts. And if we don't learn from what we've just gone through, and if we don't continue in the brilliant way that I believe we've all worked, we have missed a real trick. And whilst the housing executive are working on an exit plan or recovery plan, as I like to fear, I like to call it, um, the, the, the mood music has been very positive and they want to engage. My concern is that if, if we do revert to type, we're just going to get lost in this and we would ask the committee to have special cognizance of how we move forward um, on that. Um, so that was the COVID thing. Hopefully we're starting positively here. I'm going to hand over to Kevin uh, to give um, providers view on some of the evidence from a couple of weeks ago. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Kevin, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to comment on the evidence that we were presented with on the 17th of June. Um, it was suggested that supporting people projects uh, could use housing benefits or engage in fundraising to um, make up the shortfalls that follow years of frozen funding. This just isn't possible. Um, firstly, we're, we're legally prohibited from using housing benefits to provide support. Uh, that's been the case for a number of years now. Secondly, charitable bodies such as charitable trusts uh, won't consider applications to replace shortfalls in statutory funding. Uh, the National Lottery, for example, is very specific on this. It actually includes it in its guidance that it sends out to potential applicants. Um, Thirdly, the idea that we could su supplement our income from um, charitable shops is a little bit doubtful, to say the least, at the moment. We'd be entering a saturated market and competing with international brand names. I think we'd be more likely to lose money than make any. And in terms of public donations, we do get public donations, but these are mostly given to us uh, for the benefit of the client group, um, particularly you know, during the summer to make sure that they get, they get something uh, over the Christmas period. Um, First Housing, my organisation, has 17 um, supporting people projects. Um, all of them were set up with 100% funding. The service level agreement that we sign up to states that um, the funding will be reviewed annually um, to take account of any inflationary updating. But over the last 14 years, since 2007, that has not happened. What that means is that supporting people funded organisations, the situation is now critical. Um, we haven't had an inflationary uplift, uplift since 2007. Uh, the services were, received a 5% cut in 2018-19, uh, another freeze in 1920, it was frozen again in 2021. We're often told that we're lucky because the, the Supporting People Fund is protected and that continuing to protect it is a priority. But in reality, it's not protected. It's deep frozen. Um, if you calculated using the Bank of England indicator, you would find that the value of the Supporting People Fund is now 32% less in real terms than it was in 2007. Um, as a result, we've had to cut back on existing services. Um, 
recruitment and retention has become very, very difficult. Uh, most, of the, most providers don't even have the ability to offer modest pay increases. Uh, many services are in significant deficits and without some action, a number of them may not survive. Um, it was also suggested that supporting people is a light touch service. Um, we're supporting homeless people, uh, providing emergency, temporary accommodation, community support services. We work with people with mental health issues, provide addiction support, uh, support for youth services, rehabilitation services for people with offending backgrounds, tenancy support, preventative work, uh, children at risk of being taken into care, support for people living with disabilities. Many of the clients we work with have multiple needs. They, they receive support from more than one of our services. I mean, the work we do is, is complex and challenging. It's become more complex over the last five years or so. It, it's demanding hands-on hard work. Um, I, doubt, I doubt you would find anybody who actually works for a supporting people agency who would either recognize or agree with the term light touch. Um, my own staff over the last 14 years have watched as teachers, uh, doctors, nurses, bus drivers, refuse collectors um, have had pay increases um, brought, brought about usually to, to keep up with inflation. Um, the NIH staff themselves have had more than 12% in increases over that, that period. What that means now for us is that Last year, my staff found themselves earning just 31p an hour, uh, more than the minimum wage. Um, I think it's a big ask for them to uh, have gone through what they've gone through, and an even bigger ask to ask them to do it again in a second wave. Um, I have a committee to try to ensure that um, we don't go into a 15th year in the same shape that we are now. Uh, thank you. I'd like to hand you over to David. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? And indeed, David, go ahead. Okay, thanks very much. I think the theme that we want to get across today uh, as four providers is that we are at a, at a quite a, a critical juncture in terms of the learning that we have gained about how COVID has impacted upon us in the last um, number of months. And um, if we go back to the 6th and 7th and 8th of March, um, and we were very much kind of working together in a situation where we were trying to anticipate that the worst would happen. And um, so it didn't, but it didn't happen because of certain reasons. And what I want to do is to, is to, is to focus on, on, on the health relationship with COVID, but then extend that to its relationship with the Supporting People program going forward. Uh, because we really feel that the health intervention has been key and has to be key um, with regards to the success of supporting people in the future. Um, I think firstly, what we'd want to do is to thank our health colleagues um, and our colleagues in the housing executive as well for the support and intervention that's come about as a result of the COVID response to homelessness. Make no mistake that lives would have been lost without health working along supporting people and homeless providers. And in addition, the interventions prevented additional utilisation of hospital beds and ICU beds um, from people experiencing homelessness. Examples of the interventions coming from health are um, the, the Belfast Homeless Health Hub, the Western Health and Social Services Homelessness Nursing Intervention, the inreach and outreach assistance given from the Belfast Trust Nursing Team. And um, as, as Jim has said already, interview, interventions have included advice on the distribution of controlled substances, the management of mental health and suicidality, and the management and treatment of those who were suspected to be COVID positive in the hospital population. Um, it's been mentioned already that a high level cross department mental multi agency group was set up and responded very quickly once COVID started. Um, and ha had a, a key part in managing the consequences of COVID and coordinating the operational response. So whilst homeless service providers have always considered to this to be the case, the response to homelessness has always been deficient without 
health being equal partners in strategy and operational de development of an effective regional homelessness strategy. Um, look, the commitment of our health professionals involved in the delivery of services can't be that doubted, but managing the pandemic now provides us with the direct evidence that health can no longer be on the periphery of decision making and funding going forward uh, for homeless services. Um, we obviously have a, a short term objective that um, health interventions um, required to roll out the NIHE response plan are in place and we're again ready to ramp up the health related aspects of the second surge occurs. And this includes the provision of appropriate isolation of cocoon and a proactive approach to testing and health support for those who may be in housing first type accommodation. And whilst it did take us a while to get there, we're now clear on the distribution of PPE to SP related services. And in the longer term, we're really urging the Assembly to ensure that health no longer has a peripheral role in dealing with homelessness. Um, and is directed to participate financially and strategically to play a part in ending homelessness. Um, and we consider that this requires legislation and also requires a revamp in how the regional homelessness strategy is delivered to bring together the various strands that now exist in one cohesive approach. Okay. Thank you. Um, and on behalf of the group, what I'd like to do is just kind of uh, put our three key points chair yes, um, yeah, you, thank, thank you very much um, so point one is that COVID response has provided co conclusive evidence that health is key to dealing with the consequences of homelessness and ending homelessness it's now time to have a, a truly integrated regional homelessness strategy that has ownership and strategic programmatic and funded commitment from health um, it's now time for legislation to be put in place to make this happen the second point that we'd like to make, make is this issue around capitalisation and learning on, on what we've achieved and what has been achieved. It's been incredible how statutory and voluntary agencies have worked together. Um, and we need to capitalise upon the advancements made and deal with the consequences of any second surge. So now's the time to ensure that the leadership and mechanisms are in place to manage the, the, the activities that need to be put into place to protect health of workers and people experiencing homelessness. Obviously, we welcome the additional funding of treatment C, 7 million, again, secured towards the recovery plan. And the third point and final point that we'd like to make is that social care staff working in homelessness deserve nothing less than proper reward and recognition for the part they've played in saving lives. And we have to find a way where providers of services can in introduce a progressive wage structure for the workforces which addresses the complex environment in which they work. Uh, this involves an immediate addressing of the way in which supporting people from is protected, increased and administered, as the current processes are not addressing the fundamental weaknesses of the funds administration. And, 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 and the final point is that, you know, as a, as a set of charities, we're not seeking a bottomless pit of money. Charities are usually willing to adapt and modify and as needs and circumstances, circumstances change. And that's absolutely been evidence, evidence during the, the COVID crisis in the way that we've adapted. Um, and we're willing to adapt in the future in order to, uh, to make uh, the Supporting People Fund work. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, thank you. Um, is that your brief and finish, Jim? Yes? Uh, yes, Chair, happy to take any questions that the panel uh, may have. Okay, look, thank you very much. Um, I'll just kick it off then. Um, uh, firstly, by saying a big thank you and recognising just <coughs> what hard work that, I mean, you were certainly throwing in at the deep end um, at the beginning of this pandemic, but um, I, um, I, I know from your organisations you're well and, well and truly used to working at throwing in at the deep end um, because that's part of the, the job. 
um, that you do. Um, and I have to say, sitting here today, listening, especially to what uh, I have to, what Kevin was saying in particular, um, I, if I, I think back even to six, seven years ago, sitting in the old DSD committee, things have not changed greatly in those years uh, about that, uh, about whether it's funding, whether it's a, a collective responsibility, um, and the whole issue around homelessness. It really hasn't. There hasn't been too much of a difference in all of those years. So I absolutely get it. And I remember way back then in whatever year, 14, 15, 16, you know, jumping for joy that um, supporting people had been ring-fenced and praising those ministers at the time of wonderful, how wonderful that was that this money had been ring-fenced and yet we're whatever, six, seven years down the line now and yes, it has been ring-fenced but it hasn't seen that uplift and uh, we as a committee uh, absolutely get that, um, that, that there needs to be changes within that. So uh, yeah, it's a wee bit of deja vu. Um, sitting here today that has brought me back very many years of the old committee here uh, talking about these issues. But I absolutely get it and I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged also, Jim, by what you said about the, the multi-agency um, group and how you have been working as a team and that has been fantastic. And I suppose that draws me in then to ask a question um, around going forward and being part of a multi-agency team. I absolutely agree that, um, that the Department for Communities cannot have sole responsibility over homelessness. Homelessness is much, much bigger than that and it most certainly it falls into other um, other departments, um, especially into the health department. So it's it's just to ask you, um, you know, are you getting any level of funding from health at present within your the, the people that you represent? If not, how much funding would would you imagine? What percentage of funding should they be making? And also, if you can tell us um, what do you think they should be doing that they aren't doing right now in supporting you as homeless providers? Can I can I maybe take that that yep. question to start off with, Chair? Um, my sense and our sense is that health now um, appreciates that homelessness is an issue for them. There's absolutely no question about that. Um, we, we have worked much better and we need to continue to work much better. But the way in which we do that is firstly through political will. If we can get uh, our politicians, you, your parties, to agree that homelessness is an issue that we need to deal with, we can very quickly put in place legislation that not only asks government departments to have due regard for homelessness, but actually compels them to take an action. So that's the first part. And if you can get government departments to realise and do that, that's a key start. Um, there is a way in which, I mean, we've talked about money, but we had a conversation about a year ago with the permanent secretaries and a number of other agencies in Simon Community Building. And we offered a, an idea that we presented with Queen's University of Belfast, and it was about data mapping. Now, without going into the detail of what data mapping is, it looks at information across all of the government departments and where homelessness touches them or burns their purse. So it looks at health, and that could be GP surgeries, it could be uh, ambulance service, it could be um, a and &E, and it starts then to collate uh, a, an amount of money so what we were saying was, if we look at that with housing, with justice, with health, we get to a picture of how much homelessness actually costs. And, and the estimation is that this runs into hundreds of millions. So whilst we're saying that we need to protect budgets, we're not necessarily saying that you need to inject a whole load of more money. We need to do a very quick piece of work to look at the totality of what we already spend. And we need to spend it better. And we can spend it better. Um, because at the minute we are leaking money, we have, uh, I counted, seven different strategies dealing with homelessness, and not many of them uh, are, are joined up. We are having a stick and plaster approach on this, and the wound is getting bigger and the plaster is getting smaller. So uh, it would be wrong of me just to say we need X amount of, of pounds here. We need a different kind of conversation, and we can facilitate that with political will, with legislation, and with government actually stepping up. No, I, thank you for that, Jim. I suppose that, that leads me on. Um, we, you know from the briefing that we had, the supporting people briefing um, that we had, uh, that we had asked the question about moving out of COVID and about homelessness when we come out of COVID. And they had come up and, you know, that said that they were now going to have some uh, exit strategy in place looking at that. And, you know, 
when we talk about being equal partners in a homelessness strategy, um, we also need to look at, at equal partners coming out of COVID and how we tackle homelessness. So it's just to ask, um, have, have you been uh, involved in developing that plan? Um, and you know, and are, are high widely um, have the homelessness su su supporters or uh, providers group been involved in that? Maybe I can come into this chair. Yes, um, one of the one of the um, pieces that we advocated uh, early on in the in the COVID response was a liaison a person, um, and that liaison person between the voluntary sector and the statutory agencies was appointed and, and, and funded by the housing executive. So we've had a, a, an operational um, expert group um, of providers that has been um, has been liaison, liaising directly with the with the housing executive on what we consider to be uh, the components of, of of a response plan. From from our own point of view, that uh, needs to focus on those who are in non-standard accommodation. Lots of people um, were um, taken off the streets, and 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 it was a a, a fantastic. Um, intervention, but they need to be um, supported um, and, and found accommodation. And that is probably one of the key issues of this next part of the recovery plan. Where do the tendencies come from? Um, where, where does the community support come from? Um, and where does the health related support come from? So, so it's, it's about tendencies and health related community services uh, in order to make sure that uh, the people who have complex needs don't return to rough sleeping um, and, and can sustain tenancies going forward as well. Um, just then a follow up on that about sustaining tenancies, and I know uh, certainly as a constituency MLA, um, we have many people out there who um, have mental health problems or have addictions of whatever that might be, and for them to sustain tenancies is, is extremely difficult. And we know, um, I certainly get it through my office many times where people are moved every other month nearly um, because of those reasons. So it's just to ask, under the supporting people, um, that part of the work that you do with supporting people um, is that to, to, to encourage people or to help those people sustain those tenancies um, uh, you know, and, and help them to uh, blend in and become part of that community that, they, that they're, they're living in. Um, because, uh, I mean, we, 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 we hear horrendous stories from various people that are, are living around many of these people who have come into new areas. It's just to ask, you know, it's important people, people part of that, of supporting those people to integrate and become part of a community. Go um, ahead. Yes, I, I mean, it's absolutely central to what we do. Um, the, the essence of, of floating support is, is to to ensure people can stay where they are. I think uh, going forward, it's going to be even more important that we get that right. Um, I think uh, a number of us work with uh, work with and have projects working with older people. I think that they are going to be facing a particular set of challenge go going forward. Um, after the first wave, it's go going to be very, very difficult um, to deal with um, the emotions that they're going to have about the idea of, of going into care homes. Um, and the more work we can do to keep them where they are, is that's going to be absolutely crucial. Uh, we're also going to have to look at um, shared accommodation where five or six people are, are living together um, and how best to, to move forward on that. So yes, these are, these are absolutely key issues. Sorry. Oh, David, sorry, you wanted to come in. David, go ahead. Yeah, it's just that each of us as providers have intensive flow and support services that are aimed towards people with complex needs. And um, part of, I suppose, the, the, the strategic direction for the housing executive is on the, the, the future rollout of, of, of housing first and uh, the regional rollout of that. And I think that's that's going to be critical in, in dealing with the, I suppose, the that 10 to 15 to 20 percent of people who have really complex needs um, these intensive um, support services and that probably will be an area that requires health health intervention and 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 investment just follow on from that to do with intensive support services 
Um, I, whenever we, I, I, I'm not branding people who find themselves homeless or in a, a homelessness situation that they have addiction problems or they have mental health problems because it can happen to anybody. There, for the grace of God, go all of us that we live in a home and that we we can afford to pay our mortgage and everything else. Um, but there will be many out there who find themselves in a homelessness situation who don't require maybe that same intensive support but provide a little bit of support just to get them through and to get them on to you know, the next stage of their life, wherever that may be, be leading them. And it's just to ask, you know, how do you balance that with your supporting people? You know, does the intensive support eat up most of the budget? Um, or, or you know, is it recognised that there are people, people out there that do, if I, if I can use the term light touch, which I don't believe you do for a second, but um, you know, how does that balance with your budget? Go I'm, ahead, I'm, happy, I'm happy to add, answer that. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the needs assessment locally is, is you, well, there's two aspects to this. One is that, you know, um, people don't go into temporary accommodation if they don't need to. And so the, this uh, point of entry into the system when they present first um, to the housing executives, homeless, or to us as agencies is critical for us to make an assessment. And I'm moving people out, out of um, hostel accommodation as soon as you can is another kind of critical step. So yes, um, that needs assessment is there and there are a range of services that do kind of meet people at, at, at the at the variety level of need. Um, flat support um, is is available for, for, for many people um, and 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 programs are funded for that. And then secondly there is the is there is the intensive support that's required tr through agencies like our, uh, like ourselves, uh, and and hasn't first been an example of that. Okay, Jim, you want to come in? Uh, yes, Chair. If I can just add, um, I mean, we we receive amounts of money from um, the housing executive through the Support and People Fund, but really we have to go the extra mile for those individuals who require more intensive support. That, that fund never gets topped up. So, for example, we have had to, to pay for our own schemes that support people who have mental health and addiction services. Uh, Simon Community has been running in deficit with support people from them for the last three years. Um, so we've been carrying deficits of over £300,000 on that. Uh, and that's because we have a commitment. All of our organisations will go the extra mile. We will work with volunteers. We will provide that service as long as we possibly can. But unless we have a fundamental review of how these services are supported in the future, we won't be able to sustain that. Um, so the fund allows us to do a certain amount. We just have to carry the rest of it, and we're doing it. But we probably can't do it forever if we don't get some commitment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to members. I have Kelly, then Mark, and then Frass. I'm going to start with Kelly. Thank you very much, Chair. Jim, if I could maybe ask you, um, you've just mentioned something that um, has been a bit of a bugbear for mine for many years. Um, full cost recovery model would be something that would certainly help you. Um, I, I, we're aware as a committee, we had Maura Doherty in a while back, and she happened to mention that the Concordat Agreement with the community and voluntary sector was being reviewed. Um, if that is being reviewed, I would expect full cost recovery modelling to be included as, as a future proofing um, to enable sustainable organisations. Um, have you had any discussions with the department about the Concordat Agreement update? And um, how has the department picked up with your full, full cost recovery, um, you know, what you put forward to them? Um, thank you, Kelly, for the question. We haven't had any discussions. Um, certainly, I'll speak on behalf of the Simon Committee. We haven't had any discussions around that, and we would certainly welcome it. Anytime we talk about uh, full cost recovery, it tends to get shut down fairly quickly in that the fund's frozen. Uh, you're lucky to, to get rolled over on the contracts. And in some ways, I suppose we are. We're, we're still getting an amount of money. We would welcome full cost recovery. We have had no sense that it's heading our way or could possibly head our way. Uh, the others may have a different view, but we haven't heard about it. I think it would be something that perhaps, um, well, we'll talk to the committee later that we might want to ask because different departments take different approaches on that. Um, 
Um, just on that then, um, one of the things when I worked in the community and voluntary sector, we had started to get so fed up with grant funding being frozen and messed about with and cut whenever departments felt about it that we were starting to move into the contracting territory. Um, contracting, as we know, different to grants. Grants, um, you set the targets and um, you're basically able to use the money to meet your, your objectives. Contracts on the other side would be the department. Um, dictating targets and, and saying the way forward, but it's it's a more, um, how would you say, it, protected way of being funded because if you have a contract agreement, it's a legal agreement. Has there been any discussion about supporting people uh, moving forward, um, undertaking any types of contracting as opposed to grant making? Um, I think Kevin was looking to come in on that one. Yeah, there, there's, been, there's been quite a bit of discussion. Um, we held a contract for four years with the executive to provide um, a private private sector access scheme, uh, which came to an end in 2019. And although that that's stayed inside the uh, the strategy, nothing's happened with it for the last two years. Um, and supporting people have introduced an element of competition into um, the way in which they award services, but. Along with that competition, there hasn't been any of the freedoms that um, you might expect to operate within a contract. It's one of the things we have entered into discussion with the DFC about over the last few weeks. Uh, as Jim said earlier, we're, we're very happy to take a flexible approach to what we do. We'd very much like to get into a situation in which we actually control some of the budget that we have. At the moment, if, if we could find a way to provide our services at the same level with one post less, supporting people will take that money off us that, that we've saved. We'd like to be in a position where we knew in advance that if we were able to save that money, we could apply it to another part of our service. Thank you. I would reiterate that um, from a perspective that if we have greater freedom in terms of the universal pot, pot that we have access to, um, we have that flexibility to be able to look at the range of services that and actually adapt those services to, to greater needs uh, or uh, an overall different, uh, uh, the same impact or even greater impact with the overall amount of money that we have. So we would wel welcome, we, we, we've started discussions um, on, on that front, but we'd welcome obviously uh, further moves on that. And that in turn might help address some of the issues around terms and conditions as well. And my final question is more on the policy side of things. At the moment, um, the homelessness strategy sits within um, the housing executive. Um, and I know that Carol McKellen, our minister, has accepted the fact that a new decade, new approach, there was a, a negotiated position where there would be a new housing outcome. Do you believe, and I, and I read in your document, um, that rooflessness is not homelessness? You know, rooflessness is a, is a different thing. Homelessness is so much bigger. Do you think in the future going forward that something like the housing strategy should be retained within the department rather than the housing executive to help with that cross-departmental investment and coming together? Um, is that something that, that you would welcome or leave it alone? I, I can, I'll take that one. Yeah. Um, I, can I take that one, please? Um, I would certainly welcome where strategy sits with the department rather than the housing executive. Um, and colleagues may disagree. The difficulty is that um, what, what we're working to now is a very disparate set of policies that are trying to guide this. So at this point in time, we have a review of a supporting people program from 2015, which hasn't been bottomed out. We have a, a draft SP strategy We've got a homelessness strategy, which is more than 50% of the way through. We've got a chronic homelessness strategy. We've got an interdepartmental action plan. And potentially now we're going to have a recovery plan. At some point, we need to say, when do we stop producing plans and strategies? And when do we actually do something meaningful? So if the department has to take that in because effectively it owns policy and the housing executive is its delivery mechanism, I think that that's the way to go. Thank you. <laughs> I think I think that I think both gentlemen agreed with you there. I see Kevin shaking his head. I'm sorry, David, you wanted to come in? Yeah, just following through on the theme of how um, health is brought 
forward as an equal partner, there needs to be, you know, real consideration then if they are going to be equal partners in the delivery of a home, regional homelessness strategy there, where, where the, the, the actual strategy lives. Um, and, and, and I would consider that to be um, from a departmental level perspective in order for um, ministers to be able to kind of liaise um, jointly on, the, on its delivery. Yeah, I know just to follow on from what uh, Kelly's question there, I know whenever I was looking at your brief and certainly when I was speaking to my committee clerk before today's meeting, I had certainly thought, you know, this is something that we need to have joint committee meeting with health on. Um, at some stage, and even with the criminal or with the justice department, as our justice committee as well, you know, because this is just—I don't think this can stand alone within the Department of Communities. It, it's so much bigger than there's so much bigger than that. Um, so that is uh, certainly, I think, would be my view, and uh, I'm sure it would be the view of the committee as well. Um, that this needs to go beyond that. So just to, just to point that out to you as well. Um, so I'm going to move on then to uh, our next person is Mark. Mark, are you there? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. I think uh, yourself and Kelly, have, what, what you haven't covered in the questions, uh, the guys have probably covered in the answers that they've given to them, just to suppose echo uh, your words of thanks and praise uh, to those working in the sector for the heroics that they've performed, uh, particularly over the past few months. But like you said it yourself, they're used to performing in extremely stressful situations and do so, so well. The thing is, this time, they got more help to do so, and look what has been accomplished with that help. So I think it's important that, that we do uh, learn from that, that we continue it, and that we have to do everything uh, to support that going forward, working with other committees and departments. You made the, chair, or the point, Chair, about the, well, now as we move out of the COVID period, what becomes of, of, of those who have been placed in emergency accommodation and, 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 and so forth. But I think we have to think even beyond that. The supporting people budget, as, as we've heard before and heard again today, has been ring-fenced, but in real terms, that's a reduction. You know, that's just a basic financial reality. But not only is it a financial reality in, in, in terms of inflationary pressures, we have to look at how pressures on the sector have spiralled massively uh, over the past few years in particular, and how, with the economic carnage that we are uh, on the cusp of, they're going to spiral completely out of control. I'd like to know, I suppose, from the guys, what sort of planning is going into that, or do they dread to think of it? I'm sure they do. How well equipped are we as a place uh, to, to deal with that? And what sort of more investment and support do they need uh, to equip them and others to deal with it as well? Okay. Yep, go ahead, Kevin. Did you want, or sorry, David, sorry, David, do you want to respond? Yeah, well, I suppose if, if, if we have um, a bit of a, a forward looking piece, obviously, um, we're we're trying to prepare for a possible second surge, you know, and we use the learning that we have had and the support that we've had from the staff of agencies to be able to do with that, you know. Obviously, the practices that we put into place have minimised the, the, the impact on the wider health uh, um, kind of in, um, resources, as I pointed out earlier on. You know, very little kind of inter um, people going into ICU, very little people hitting, hitting hospital beds. We want to maintain that, obviously, as an immediate piece. Um, I think that it's 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 really difficult to see whether the economic impact will have a um, some sort of 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 knock-on effect on those presenting as homeless. We know that there's been anecdotally an increase in the amount of young people who've been coming into homelessness due to addiction-related issues and. You know, we've we've seen kind of the issues around domestic violence being a f feature as well. Um, but presentations have not gone through the roof. Um, um, if, if if the private rented sector is impacted upon um, in any great way, um, you know that could be another an, another I suppose way in which people will find themselves in, in, into into homelessness. 
But for me, I think I, I'd go back to kind of an earlier point that I made. What 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 can be done in this this next phase? And for for us, I think the, for uh, you know for ourselves. Um, working with the complex vulnerable group, it is the creation of the actual tenancies, affordable tenancies for single people, um, is key, um, and it is a really urgent look on how either existing health related services can be calibrated, or additional funding comes from health, because as, as you know, I sound like a bro- broken record. The, the proof is now there that uh, health intervention makes a real difference in homelessness. Jim, you want to come in? Yeah, just, uh, I mean, Mark, Mark's point's a good one. This is something that we really fear because we know anecdotally that, not even anecdotally, we know that the demand for our service is already increasing. Our phone is ringing a lot more and there's only so much that we can do with the available bed spaces. There's a few things I think we need to do. Um, the current homelessness strategy describes a scenario where emergency accommodation provision is going to be dismantled in favour of Housing First or, or basically homes where we support people to stay in. The difficulty is we're not building enough social homes. We don't have um, the private rented sector as a, a kind of a, a user-friendly sector. So my my view would be we need to relook at the timing of that and we need to protect our, our hostels, our, our, you know, our premises where we can accommodate a lot of people and accommodate them safely. Um, we, we do on those points, we need to build more homes and are we going to be able to do it in a recession? I'm not sure, but we need to think of ways of making the private rented sector more attractive and we can look at rent guarantees, we could look at um, different kinds of, of supports that we give landlords the assurances and there have been social letting agencies who have done that very successfully in Scotland, uh, so we need to look at that model and as well as that, what we need to do, and, and Kevin described it, we need to look at our funding so we don't become minimum wage employers because as soon as we do that, people will not do hard, difficult, challenging um, work for very little money, money that they could get working in a local, local supermarket. So, Mark, whilst that doesn't answer your question directly, there are a few things that we could do quite quickly that isn't money related, and there are a few things that we need to, to think about how we spend our money better. Okay, uh... Thank you, Kevin, and thanks, David, and again, uh, thank you for the, the great work that you do. Okay, thank you, Mark. I'm going to move on then to Fra. Hi, Fra. Fra, we can't hear you at the moment. We'll just... Hold on. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, thank you. Yeah, no, the, uh, it's, main tech, it's main technology, sure. I uh, want to thank you guys for the, the presentation. And uh, many of the issues that raised in the, in the presentation uh, today that I'm sure the three of them have raised in many, many other occasions over the years. You know, we talk about homelessness, uh, we talk about supporting people, uh, we talk about uh, the housing selection scheme, we talk about the input from health, and we need to get real on this here because uh, it, it, it is too important, especially in the present climate, uh, not, not only of the virus and the possibility of where that's going, uh, but, but, but also uh, that uh, how you move this whole thing forward and how you, uh, for once, ensure that departments that have a direct responsibility like health uh, stick with it and uh, provide the resources and help provide the resources and realize that there's a problem and that there are willing, there are willing people there uh, and the many groups, like the three that we're from today, that uh, can carry that forward. But uh, so most of the questions have been asked uh, off the, 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 the people that are in front of us, uh, but I'm, I'm just looking through the report, the report is actually excellent and lazy. But in terms of uh, the, the, the the people who would be uh, what have been called rough sleepers in, in the, the likes of towns and city centres and uh, who have been off the streets as this uh, rare virus progressed, what next? And I think that's a big question. What next? How do we uh, with that in terms of homelessness? 
Although I would probably uh, think in there also that uh, I know people are talking about, about the private rented sector. Uh, I think the private rented sector uh, has to get, in terms of conditions, in terms of uh, the, 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 the affordability, we need to get a test together also. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, I, th I think there's, there's, there's two answers to that. D David's already um, raised the issue of, of housing first, which um, the DePaul has demonstrated can be made to work, uh, in which you actually introduce someone straight into um, the, their own accommodation. Uh, I think within the private within the private sector, what's what's often missing is is the support. Um, the private sector, by and large, gets very little support. Um, Social housing, because of the existence of the housing executive and housing associations, etc., gets plenty of support, and our own services would regularly get referrals from that. People in, living in the private sector generally uh, are not supported, and they need to be. Um, the housing executive did for 15 years uh, fund a project uh, to do just that, but they haven't done anything in the last two years, and they need to start to do that again very soon, I think. Um, I think, as Jim pointed out, um, building social housing is a challenge. It's going to be even more of a challenge if the builders can't get, in, get on site throughout this winter. Uh, we need to be looking at uh, creative alternatives uh, immediately. Okay, Fra? Yep, yep. All right. I think there's been no other member has indicated that they want to comment or ask a question. But can I thank you, um, the three of you, for coming and briefing us today? Um, and, and I remember uh, at, a, at another committee meeting here several years ago, and I'm glad you brought up the, the issue of young people. We had five young people who came and briefed um, a, a committee roughly about five or six years ago who were all under 18, who had found themselves um, homeless. Um, through no fault of their own, and just the struggles they had having to live with in adult accommodation with other adults who maybe did have some addiction or mental health problems, which frightened them, but they had no other choice on that. Um, so, I mean, we when we talk about homelessness, it, it covers a whole gambit of, of, of people and, and different reasons why they end up in that um, situation, and I have to say that briefing at that time was probably one of one of the most hard hitting briefings that I had sat as an MLA in any committee, um, and really did have an impact on me at that time. Um, so I, I was uh, I, I kind of glad you brought up young people because I do think more needs to be done there as well. And I also would I mean if it, we weren't in COVID nineteen right now and still on in uh, having to socially uh, distance and all of the rules and regulations around that. I'd be encouraging members to go along and visit um, one of our hostels. I, I did that as well. Maybe four or five years ago, I went to Stella Maris down at the docks and uh, was well received by the staff and by the, the residents there and got to hear some of their stories and, and why they were there. And, um, you know, so I think it's good for us as members as well um, to get out there and to see just firsthand the work that's being done um, by yourself. So maybe when all of this is over, um, we will come out and maybe be able to come and visit you and, uh, and speak to you directly. Um, and look, thank you. I really appreciate you coming in front of us today and briefing us. And no doubt, um, as we go up, go forward, looking especially at the housing strategy, um, we will be hearing from you again going into the future. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Chair, and, yeah, and, and everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, bye bye. Thank you. Okay, members, um, then following on from that briefing, okay, remind me of issues that we have to flag up there from that briefing, because I haven't been writing everything down as I go along as I normally have. Chair, there were a number of issues in relation to one of the key issues was the multi-agency working okay. that needs to be continued, and particularly the input of health yes. department, which is the perennial issue. Okay, so then we need to then um, put something in writing then um, to the department and also to health as well. Um, about continuing those conversations. Go ahead, Kelly. Can I maybe ask um, that um, homelessness strategy the housing executive has? Can we maybe get an update on what's happening on that? Absolutely. Yep. Um, Maura Doherty came to us before to talk about that Concordat agreement, and I know it was just being talked about. It wasn't formally in consultation, but it might be useful to get an update on that because full cost recovery as a method to fund charities means that they get they can 
ask for 15% of their overheads as part of their grant. Um, it might be useful just to find out if the Concordat agreement is going to include something like that. Um, yeah, because it's, it's the way that grants are going and different departments do, do allow it. I, I'm just conscious that um, whenever uh, the, when we go into our autumn session, um, and I'm also conscious of what the minister's priorities are and the work that we have to do then, but I'd imagine most well, certainly housing is one of the, the minister's priorities and this um, will fall under that as well. So all of that information will be useful to have um, whenever we're going forward. Any other members want to bring up any other issue at this juncture before we move on? Nope, everybody happy? Yeah, okay. Um, we'll then move on then to agenda item number seven. Am I correct? <coughs> yes, we are. Uh, which is correspondence. Um, can I just draw members' attention then to the correspondence memo on page 31 of your meeting packs? Um, and first of all, on that, in relation to the LCM, members should note that the committee will consider um, draft report on the LCM at next week's briefing. Um, just to advise members of that. So I would like to ask then, have members any issues they want to raise um, within the correspondence memo? No, I sure. just want, Sorry, go ahead, Fra. <clears throat> just a, just a note, uh, looking at the thing back from Nicola um, Allen yes. in relation to the Solis thing, uh, both the, the presentation that we've just had and uh, the, the, the presentation uh, that we had earlier, I think we, we, we should send them again to the relevant ministers uh, because I, I think it contains a, a number of good suggestions and uh, certainly a willing a willingness on behalf of many of them organisations to step forward again to help. Okay, no, thank you for that. That certainly would be merit in that. Um, so there would. I just wanted just to bring up the one to do with the, um, the bear with me, did I just find it here? It's the Federation of Sea Anglers. So we know on the memo we've asked um, that that be forwarded on to NI. And I would just like um, that, uh, that Sport NI, sorry, <coughs> Um, come back to this committee with a response to that, just to see how they can help out um, that organisation um, on getting registered and going forward. So that's the only thing I wanted to bring up under correspondence. So nothing else members want to bring up there? No? Okay. We will then move on to agenda item number eight, which is our forward work programme. And as I've said um, earlier, that we will have the minister in um, next week's next week to brief us and also the Northern Ireland Union of Supported Employment. So again, any comments or questions on that? No? Nope. Fine. And just remind members if they can look through um, the email that Kevin had sent out earlier today to do with the list of, of suggested topics to the Minister. If they have anything else, can they please let us know? Um, the Minister has been good enough to come and brief us. We don't want to, we're not going to bounce her. That's not what this committee does. And of course, we want to welcome that Minister back to this committee at some stage as well. So um, I think we want to have that good working relationship with, certainly with her um, in order. That's why we want to provide her with, it, her with as much information as possible as well. Not saying that there won't be questions that will come up in the day. Fair enough, that will happen, absolutely. Um, so if members can get that through to um, Kevin as well. So then I'll move on to agenda item number nine, which is AOB. Has any members any AOB, Andy? Yeah, sure. I just wanted to raise one point. It's been a matter I know other members ha have brought up in relation to changing places toilet fund. Um, back in March, the, the Chancellor announced a £30 million fund uh, in relation to for England for a changing places toilet mm -hmm. fund. Uh, and I wrote to the finance minister at the time to see if there was any Barnet consequences. And I don't believe there are. He had said there may be later on in 2021. I'm just wondering if we could write to the minister of finance to ascertain whether there were Barnet consequences in respect of that. And also he'd indicated that any potential fund um, being set up in Northern Ireland may well be a matter for the Minister for Communities. And so if we could write to the Minister for Communities to see if that would be a matter that she would wish to take forward also in relation to the establishment of such a fund to support um, the establishment or the implementation of uh, changing places of toilets within Northern Ireland. And I do, I do know the... The finance ministers give a commitment around the building regulations, uh, but it would be good to see a fund, dedicated fund set up also. No, absolutely. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I, I absolutely think we should certainly write and find out more information on that. I remember dealing with that um, issue when I chaired the health committee and going to the, the, our Department of Health and asking them just how many changing places they had within their uh, estate. And it was, it was actually quite frightening, the, the, the lack of them. 
Um, you know, and I know even in this building, I think we've won, uh, and that that that's it. Um, so I do think, and even for local governments, for planning, for all of that, there needs to be much stricter regulations put in place. So thank you, Andy, for bringing that Absolutely, up. Absolutely, Chair. And I just make the point, you know, as, as individual members and able-bodied people, I know I have a disability, but it doesn't impact me uh, in the, the extent of what it would impact some others. Okay. Uh, and we can take for granted quite often when we go out into the public domain um, how other individuals and families and those with complex disabilities have to prior plan, phone ahead, uh, make plans to make sure that there's the right provisions in place. And it's, I think it's imperative that we in government do everything we can to ensure that individuals with disabilities can fully participate within society. Thank you. Good item to bring up. Um, any other business members want to bring up? You all happy? No, yeah. no all happy. Well, I, I don't know if Mark can hear us or not. Mark, if you anything sure. you want to bring up? Sure. Sorry, Sinead? Yeah, sorry. No, I just had my hand up there. Sorry, I the... didn't see it there. Sorry. No, you're fine. Uh, listen, yes, look, it's it's just in relation to um, the Niffle clubs. Um, I've been in contact with a few of them, uh, and I know there's growing concern over... Um, obviously the financial impact that COVID's having on them. Um, there's, I know they've been in um, meetings with the IFA board, um, and you know, what I am hearing is there's quite a dismissive attitude in terms of questioning around um, uh, you know, f financial help for clubs. Um, so I, I know this committee has, has written to the IFA and the NIFL board, um, it must be over a week, maybe two weeks ago now, and you know, we still haven't received a response to that. And you know, I would fear that's you know, sort of validating the, the dismissive attitude of those organisations when, when it comes to talking about um, you know, forking up and, and, and helping clubs financially. So, you know, I would definitely want to propose that this committee writes to the IFA um, and asks for clarity and, and asks that the um, the UEFA hat trick fund, um, it's four million pounds, it's distributed annually, um, and UEFA has given directions to to um, uh, to associations that they can use that that money as they see fit. Um, and my suggestion would be that that money is distributed among the clubs to help them recover from COVID because, you know, their gate receipts and, and everything else will be down uh, and they will be facing a, a severe cash crisis. So, you know, I, I would ask that this committee again writes to the IFA seeking clarity around those issues. No, will do. Sinead, I remember you bringing that up and uh, yet we haven't received any response. I take it from... It's been about a week since we've written to... It's, yeah, yeah, it's just over a week since we've written, so we will we'll follow that up, Sinead. All right, thank, thank you. you. Um, anything else under AOB, folks? No? Okay. I'll then move on no. to agenda item 10, which is date, time and location of next meeting, and remind members that we're meeting next week, Wednesday the 8th of July, when the Minister will be here to brief us at 2pm in this room. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.